Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is based on a piece called L'Orage, or The Storm, in other words, by Friedrich Bergmuller. I um, hope I'm saying that with the correct German pronunciation. <laughs> um, English uh, speakers will say Bergmuller, so I'm sure all the German speakers <laughs> listening to this will, you know, shake their heads at that. Um, this piece uh, is part of a collection of 18 etudes. Um, we've covered one of the etudes from Opus 100, his most famous set, uh, but these ones are a little bit more advanced. I would give this L'Orage to um, a late beginner or early intermediate student. Um, I definitely think late beginner, and who knows what is a late beginner or early intermediate, that's subjective, but this is a piece that <laughs> I wouldn't give, you know, before I gave something like like this, but this is also approachable because it's not too intense with speed. You can speed it up quite a bit, but I actually really enjoy this piece at a, a more moderate tempo. It's marked Allegro, but... This piece will really target uh, helping the student with pedaling, expression, voicing, um, and many other things. But I really think that this helps so much with pedaling and learning how to read pedal markings and realizing that the composer doesn't always write every pedal marking that you're going to uh, see in a piece. And also you have some freedom, even with certain pedal markings, to make judgment calls. For instance, there's just a pedal marking in this first measure. If you do that just as it's written, it becomes extremely blurry. If you want to change on each beat, for instance, and feel maybe even, you could even maybe do it a little bit more dry because he writes pianissimo, so very soft and agitato, so. You can really feel the storminess in this. So I just wanted to preface the tutorial with some of the goals that we would be setting in this piece if you were my private student and we were going over this in a lesson. So I hope that the concepts that I present in this tutorial help become, become really efficient in your practice session. So we're going to go over things like fingering, pedaling, expression, voicing, um, and maybe even a little bit of rubato, like the pushing and pulling of time to enhance things even further. That's a concept that I like to introduce fairly early on. I will usually ask a student to get something even first, uh, unless they're really experienced or advanced. I like them to get it very even and then we will start putting in more expression. If you're an advanced player wanting to play this uh, as a set, if you wanted to play all Opus 109, maybe you can start uh, experimenting with that a little earlier on. But if you're just at that late beginner, early intermediate phase, I would definitely suggest working with the metronome you know, 25 to 50% of the time during your practice when you're first learning it for the first week or two, depending on how long it takes you to learn. And then turning the metronome off and only occasionally using it to check to make sure you're not doing anything strange, especially if you're doing self-study. I know a lot of pro practice watchers don't have private teachers due to work schedules or whatever it might be, so just double check that. Okay, let's go over some fingering. You have a few options here. Um, the thing, I, I just pulled this score off of IMSLP. I didn't have a score. I looked in the Henley app. Um, they didn't have it. So I just pulled one off, off of IMSLP.org. It's a great resource. You can all check it out. Make sure just to obey the copyright laws in your countries. But uh, one, two, one, three, two, three is what they have marked here. I think that's great fingering because that one, two, one, a lot of students would be like, ooh, that feels weird, uh, you know, to like cross over just for that brief moment. But I actually think it's a very comfortable fingering. If it bothers you though, feel free to use three, two, three and just shift the hand around. I would keep the left hand legato. Okay, let's try it without pedal. 
And you have a couple of options so far as shaping. You could really you could go down more, less, more, and then way less, and a longer growth to there. I don't like that quite as much as longer shapes. That's something that I still go over. I take you know four or five lessons a year uh, with my teacher, and we're always discussing how can we make these phrases longer. Um, I think that's the epitome of artistry, is how can you make things sound organic over long periods of time. So I think a better shape would be crescendo to there and then less and you don't need to smack the left hand you don't need that much it's mostly because that's going to make it feel agitato there what do you notice differently in bar three here he marks this whole note so you're gonna wanna hold that as you play these other notes, okay? With this being called the storm and being a very explicit character piece, like it, there's not a whole lot of, you know, you don't need a great imagination to hear the storm in this piece. Uh, and he definitely reflects that with his dynamic markings. So feel free to really go to there, like, the crashing of thunder, or if you're out in the middle of the ocean and these waves are crashing on the side of your boat, however you want to invoke imagery in your own mind, that will help to portray it to the audience. That's not to say the audience will think the exact same way you do. They, if you're thinking of something crashing over a boat, someone else might be thinking of a rainstorm being stranded in the mountains or something. I don't know. Or they might not even think of a storm at all. If they didn't look at the program before you started playing. I don't know why they would do that. But the point is, when it's vivid for you as the performer, it becomes much more vivid for the audience, and they can paint their own storyline. That's the most beautiful thing about music, the fact that it is a universal language. We all draw different inspiration from different passages, but if you aren't drawing inspiration from a passage or you're not making it vivid, it will be a bland experience for the audience as well. So I just wanted that uh, as kind of an artistic thought as we go through this piece, all right? Starting from here, you could do a few things. You could do no pedal. I think it sounds a little dry personally. I think I would do, uh, do pedal, change, change, change. If you wanted it to be a little bit more breathless, like that, you could... Release the pedal, this is very specific, but pedal, off, pedal, off. I don't think I would release it there. That'll make it sound too choppy, but. And. I feel that surge there, but then this feels more melodic to me. So I'll bring that out a little bit more and be less on this. So. It's kind of nice. Rat versus. If you get too up and down all over the place, it will start to sound seasick. And I hear students do that a lot. They shape everything the same. You have to think again of those longer lines, okay? Crescendo assai, so crescendo very much. come back down. I would do pedal, change, off on the pedal on that last beat, on that A, and then put the pedal back down on the E. Or actually, you don't even need it on the E. Just put the pedal down here after you play the D and release the E. Because you don't want that to get caught in your pedal. So, Okay? We have a repeat here. So that's...